able to, so let's get started. Hello and welcome. We are so excited to have you all here for the final session of the 2022 Triton Talks webinar series. It's been a good go so far. Today we'll be hearing from three researchers, researchers from PNNL about their work in the U.S. DOE Water Power Technologies Office Triton Initiative. This research focuses on environmental monitoring technologies and methods used to evaluate environmental stressors linked to marine energy devices. Laneg Hemry will discuss changes in habitat, followed by a discussion on marine energy sustainability and life cycle assessments with Kayleen Gunn, filling in for Alicia Amberson today, and Tyler Harris. Thank you all for being here. Before we dive in, I do have a few logistical notes for all of our attendees. We're using a Zoom webinar setup, which is a little different, and we've muted all of you to ensure there are no interruptions during the presentations. If you do have questions that come up though, please put them into the chat and I'll read them during the joint Q&A session after all of our presenters have given their talk. Talks. We'll also be including helpful links to resources and publications in the chat throughout the webinar. So keep your eye out for those. There are some really interesting resources we have for you. We are recording this webinar and we'll later post the recorded video on YouTube in our Triton Talks playlist. You can see it on the um, slides right here. This is what it looks like. We have a few videos that are already posted. So if you'd like to go back and watch any that you missed or share this one with someone, um, please feel free to do so. We'll post the link in the chat. Now it's time to meet the presenters. I'll let each person introduce themselves and let's start with Laneg Hemery. Thank you, Noelani. So hi, I'm Laneg Hemery. I'm a benthic ecologist in the coastal ecosystems teams within the coastal sciences division at PNNL. So after studying in France, I came to the US in 2013 for a postdoc in Oregon and I have stayed in the Pacific Northwest ever since. I have a multi multidisciplinary background in marine biology that allows me to bridge biology, ecology, and oceanography, and investigate questions related to marine macroevolution and conservation, global environmental changes, and sustainable use of marine environment around the world. In Triton, I lead the changes in habitat task, which I will tell you all about uh, in a few minutes. Hi everyone, um, my name is Kayleen Gunn. I am filling in for Alicia today as she is in the field and needed to take advantage of a valuable weather window to collect samples. I'm sure any field scientists here today can relate. Um, I'm a co-author on the paper we will be talking about today, so I will be presenting Alicia's slides. I'm a marine scientist and science communicator for the Triton Initiative. I have a background in coastal wetland ecology and biogeochemistry and have supported the Triton Initiative for the past four years, both as a researcher and the lead for Triton's communications, outreach, and engagement efforts. And now I'll pass it on to Tyler. Thanks. So I am uh, Tyler Harris. I am a sustainability engineer with the Operational Systems Engineering Group and Sustainability Engineering Team at Pacific Northwest National Lab. I, my background is in life cycle, environmental life cycle assessment, which I'll be talking about uh, a bit here later, and uh, also integrating other uh, aspects of quantitative aspects of sustainability, like economics and um, societal impacts with the environmental impacts, as well as doing growth curve modeling of production. So all of these impacts can be uh, monitored and minimized over time. Thanks. Thanks so much for telling each of the, um, for each of you telling us about yourselves. We're excited to learn about your research and a special thanks to Kayleen for filling in. Hopefully Alicia has a really successful day today. Mm, so now we'll move on to Laneg's talk on changes in habitat. And take it away, Laneg. Thank you, Noelani. So as the subtitle of my presentation indicates, today I will talk about uh, monitoring technologies for surveying potential changes in benthic and pelagic habitats resulting from the development of marine energy. But before I get started, I would like to acknowledge my PNNL colleagues who have helped with this work. 
So Kaylan Macares, Levi Tugade, uh, Kaylin Gurn here present, and Eddie Pablo. So why do changes in oh no, go back <laughs> good. So why do changes in habitat matter? So um, marine energy devices must be attached to the seafloor by their foundations, pilings, or anchors, and will have other parts in the water column, like devices themselves or mooring lines, on power export cables running along the seafloor. The installation and presence of these artificial structures will create physical changes and can disrupt or create new habitats and potentially alter the behavior of marine animals in the, in the area of a device. The next slide. So the potential changes to benthic and pelagic habitats are very diverse. They can be the loss of uh, benthic habitats underneath the footprint of foundations, anchors, or cable protection, the resuspension of sediments or pollutants, and the loss of organisms during the installation of cables, the scarring of sediments uh, around the seabed structures with impacts to infauna, the creation of new habitat for biophilic seaside organisms, the attraction of mobile organisms like fish to these uh, new artificial reef and fish aggregating devices. The local increase in biomass on organic matter that can trickle down the entire food web. And a potential reserve effect if fishing activities are banned in the development area with spillover out of the boundaries on the carrying capacity is reached. Next slide. All these potential effects that I listed are not specific to marine energy developments, and they have been observed in relation to many other human activities at sea. We call those other activities surrogate industries, and we can learn a lot from the research and monitoring that has been undertaken over the years. Especially when it comes to changes in habitats related to marine energy, we can learn from bottom-mounted and floating offshore wind, from oil and gas offshore activities, from power and communication cables like those linking islands and mainlands, from navigation and observation buoys, from commercial fish aggregating devices, from artificial reefs used for conservation purposes, and any other uh, artificial structures at sea, like boat wrecks or piers or whatever. Next slide. So now, how do we monitor these changes to understand whether they are resulting from human activity or due to uh, natural variability? Over the last couple of years, the Triton Initiative was looking at the technology side of this question under the Triton Field Trials or TFIT project. Uh, the um, technologies for monitoring changes in habitats are very diverse and go from sonars to cores, imagery, uh, trolls, or various other forms. Next. And so the goal of TFIT for changes in habitat was to identify sampling technologies that will provide the most consistent results across project sites so that comparison can be made between a marine, pro marine energy project and lessons can be transferred from a site to another to facilitate uh, permitting requirements. Next slide. After discussing with several subject matter experts about various technologies, it appeared obvious to the team that a thorough literature review was needed to catalog the diversity of technologies available for monitoring benthic and pelagic habitats. So this review identified a selection of technologies that should provide the best results at wave and tidal energy sites. In addition, the team selected and tested in the field a 360 degree underwater camera to monitor the artificial reef effect of a wave energy device to observe fish and other animals that aggregate around the anchors. On the basis of these desktop and field studies, the team compiled recommendations on technologies to use to monitor changes in habitat at wave and tidal sites. The next few slides, I will present the main results from both the literature review and the 360 camera field test. Next slide. Thank you. So the overall goal of our literature review was to provide an overview of the technologies most commonly used for characterizing habitats and assessing changes in these habitats in relation to marine energy. In addition, we wanted to understand especially why were some technologies selected over alternative options. And so our aim was to provide tips and advice to those who are doing the surveys on monitoring on what technologies to use and when to use them. Next. To conduct this literature review, we combed through research articles, environmental impact assessment documents, 
baseline or monitoring survey reports from the marine energy industry, but also from other uh, surrogate industries like offshore wind or oil and gas. We focused on the last 20 years and on documents related to projects from around the world, not just in the US. In these documents, we looked for information related to the reason why the authors selected specific technologies over others, as a brand model and other characteristics of the technologies, the methods used to deploy the technologies and the sampling design that were followed, how data were processed and analyzed, whether the study identified any change in the habitat that they surveyed, on any feedback the authors may have provided about the technology that they used. Next slide. So we reviewed about 250 documents. And in those documents, we identified 120 different technologies across six habitat categories that we recognized. Those were seafloor, sediment, infauna, epifauna, which includes also demersol, pelagic, and biofiling. We organized these 120 technologies into 12 broad classes that were acoustic, such as sonars, corers, dredge, grab, hook and line, net and troll, uh, plate for biocolonization, remote sensing, such as LIDAR, scrape samples, trap, uh, visual, such as an ROV or a diver equipped with a camera, and other technologies. So in interestingly, several technologies were common to more than one habitat category. The heat map on the right shows the technologies that were used in two or more habitat categories. So for example, from top to bottom, acoustic sensors were mainly used for seafloor characteristics on pelagic habitats. Corers, dredges, and grabs were almost exclusively used for collecting sediment on infauna samples. Nets and trolls mainly for epifauna and pelagic, but visual technologies were commonly used across uh, different habitat categories, however, with only sediment profile imaging for the infauna. Next slide. So the high diversity of technologies makes challenging the recommendation of one specific set of technologies for characterizing changes in benthic and pelagic habitats caused by marine energy devices. However, field variables more specific to marine energy sites should be considered when selecting a technology, such as strength of current, wave height, presence of obstacles in the water, like cables or, or devices, on any other local specificities. Next, thank you. Rather than automatically selecting technologies historically used in a specific geographic area because it was designed locally, or one available at the office because acquired for a previous project, specific technological aspects should be considered, such as whether the technology is adapted and designed to work uh, efficiently in energetic environments, like strong current, how versatile it is on if ballast weight or extra thrusters can be added, or how dependent uh, on the tether's instrument is. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so in addition to conducting the literature review that I presented, we also tested a new approach for monitoring fish activities around marine energy devices. Someone could use a scuba diver or ROV to monitor the artificial reef effect, but the presence and movement of those technologies could affect the fish behavior. Another option is to deploy a video lander that will stay still in the water, but the challenge here is to keep the target in the field of view of the camera once it is deployed from the boat. So to alleviate this challenge, uh, we selected a 360 degree underwater camera to mount as a video lander so that no matter what direction it uh, faces on the seafloor, it would be looking at our target. So we used a Boxfish 360 camera with external light, as you can see on the picture here. And we mounted it on a custom frame, custom made lander with uh, ballast weight. We deployed it in La Jolla, California to test by the anchors of, of the CalWave wave energy converter. And uh, to do so, we dropped the camera three times a day uh, for one hour each time, three days in a row. And we also measured the water visibility before and after with a Seki disk. Next. So here's a video to show you uh, what we, we got. 
But before uh, no any place starts, so to get you situated, the concrete block in the middle is the anchor from the wave energy converter. Thank you. The pointy bar in the front is part of the lander frame, and the base of the lander is a grate underneath. So the box V360 is made, made of three cameras, each one looking uh, be between the points here. Those points are due to the stitch lines that you can see uh, vertically at three three pieces of the video. And, um, and so that distorts the images a little bit. So Noelani, now you can please start. Thank you. So on this short clip, you can see two sand baths that directly interact with the bottom corner of the of the anchor on the user space left underneath the anchor by a scoured sediment. And we can also see in the front uh, an octopus on the kelp friendly. So maybe let's play one more time. The raw videos um, for the, all the deployments that we did are freely available on Primer if anyone is interested in downloading them. So we'll put the, the link in the chat. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. So here are some other examples of the footage that we got, uh, showing you the quality of the visibility or the, the different quality of the visibility on the various distances from the anchor that we were able to achieve. On the left, all three screenshots are from noon deployments, with the bottom one being the closest that we got uh, from the anchor. On the top right is a down deployment, where the anchor was barely visible at first, but the light through the water column improved as the sun rose, and so we could see it better by the end of the of the hour. On the two remaining images uh, on the bottom right, are dusk deployment start on end of dusk deployment, and you can see the anchor a little bit. But then, uh, as the, day, the the hour got darker, it disappeared behind the illumination area. Next slide. So with nine drops of one hour each, we only got a small data set, but we tried to make the best out of it. As we stitched the videos, we always placed the anchor in the middle frame and had the right and left frames facing away from the anchor. To assess the potential artificial reef effect of the anchor, we identified and counted the fish viewed by each camera every five minutes. Next. So while we couldn't make true measurements, we estimated that the camera landed each time between two and seven meters from the anchor, which provided a good view of the system. The anchor was visible on seven out of nine deployments. Two dusk drops were ended up being too dark to distinguish the anchor past the illumination area. So as you can see on this graph on the right, there was significantly more fish observed at dusk than uh, dawn or noon but we did not observe any statistical difference between our three viewing frames, left, middle, and right. So we cannot conclude on the artificial reef effects of this specific anchor based on our limited sampling. Next, thank you. However, uh, what we can do is provide recommendations for using a 360 degree camera for this purpose. So even though we used a live stream camera to assist with the deployment, it was difficult to assess our distance, like I said earlier. And so aiming very close still landed us at a conservatively, conservatively safe distance from the anchor. While uh, more fish were observed at dusk, we had to use external lights, and those lights also attracted big schools of bait fish, uh, which sometimes obstructed the view. So I would recommend to avoid the darkest hours not to attract a bait fish. The stitching of the video footage was also cumbersome, but lots of tutorials uh, exist online. And uh, fortunately, we had a professional photographer on hand to do the stitching for us. Reviewing the video footage can also take a long time. And uh, someone needs to decide uh, whether to review the entire video or specific time points. Because our goal was to test the camera on any statistical analysis was a bonus. Counting every five minutes was a manageable balance between reviewing time and fish counts. With the progress in machine learning on artificial intelligence, there is potential for the future development of an automated analysis of the 360-degree video footage. Next slide. 
As an overall conclusion, changes in habitat in relation to marine energy is a complex topic that involves many different effects at various scales. Not one single technology will enable monitoring all these effects at once, and we identified 120 different technologies through our literature review. So most common technologies are visual, such as, as drop camera, ROVs, or towed cameras, and acoustic, such as multibimic sounders or acoustic cameras. Adaptable, versatile, and tether-free technologies would be more suitable for marine energy sites. And last, despite the complexity of the video processing, a 360-degree video lander is a useful technology for surveying the artificial reef effect. Next. If you want to learn more about our two studies, I invite you to check out our papers in the Triton Special Issue in the Journal of Marine Science and Engineering, as well as a report available on TCS that expands on the literature review. Next. So thank you for listening and I look forward to your question in the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Leneg, for telling us about all of your research. That was really fun to hear about. We've included some of these links in the chat and there will be more to come, so keep your eyes out. Now we will be switching gears and pass it off to Kayleen and Tyler to discuss energy sustainability, diversity and inclusion and life cycle assessments. If you have questions for Leneg, which we encourage you to have questions, please hold on to them or write them in the chat for our Q&A session which we will have after Kayleen and Tyler's presentation, and we'll address them then. Okay, and I'll let Kayleen take over now. Thank you, Nalani and Lineg, for a great talk. Um, as the Triton field trials developed and the special issue that Lineg mentioned started to come together, Alicia and the Triton team saw an opportunity to provide a synthesis article that summarized the recommendations and explored broader impacts and environmental and social considerations beyond the scope of TFIT. Results from TFIT help promote consistent environmental monitoring methodologies to provide the necessary data to support permitting and the advancement of the industry, and this paper served to emphasize that message. Additionally, the team wanted to highlight areas that could be considered when implementing a full monitoring campaign, discuss ways to evaluate the impact and effectiveness of the recommendations, and include future topics of consideration such as marine energy sustainability and life cycle assessment next steps, which Tyler will be talking about. I am excited to present today on behalf of Alicia and alongside Tyler, and we also wanted to say thank you to our co-authors, Savannah Mishner and Joe Haxel for their efforts. Next slide, please. So Lynnaig touched on this earlier, but to reiterate and expand a bit, the Triton Field Trials project aimed to advance knowledge around possible environmental impacts of marine energy devices by assessing and improving monitoring procedures and technologies. This project explored cost-effective methods and instrumentation used to monitor four potential stressors associated with marine energy systems, including changes in habitat, as Leneg discussed, electromagnetic fields, collision risk, and underwater noise. The team then performed field tests on those various instruments at diverse sites across the U.S. to monitor these stressors. The field trial started with studying electromagnetic fields in Squin Bay, Washington in 2020, which was the initial test to kick off the project. This scenario um, did not have an operational marine energy device, but rather the cables that connect to marine energy devices were measured for magnetic fields. TFIT then conducted research in collision risk at the Portsmouth Memorial Bridge in New Hampshire, and then in the Tanana River in Alaska to test acoustic cameras for monitoring fish interactions around tidal and riverine turbines. Underwater noise was later tested at the Portsmouth Memorial Bridge as well, using a drifting hydrophone. And then to complete this, uh, this campaign, the underwater noise team deployed hydrophones and of course the changes in habitat team tested a 360 degree camera as Leneg talked about around a wave energy converter at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in California. The results and recommendations from all of these field trials were then published in the special issue we've discussed. 
More about this work can be found in previous Triton Talks webinars hosted by the research leads for each stressor, and the link to that playlist is in the chat. Um, and then the paper we're discussing today only provides high-level summaries of each of these field trials, so we encourage you to read the special issue introductory paper listed here on this slide titled Triton Field Trials, Promoting Consistent Environmental Monitoring Methodologies for Marine Energy Sites by Eves et al. if you'd like to learn more about this specific effort. Next slide, please. Due to the structure of the TFIT campaign and research goals, we were not able to address temporal considerations for environmental monitoring. Planning environmental monitoring campaigns to capture temporal movements and changes within the biological community at marine energy sites is necessary to most fully observe, measure, and record different environmental effects and interactions with a, an operational device. To visualize how to include temporal movement in an environmental monitoring campaign, the team used the PackWave test site in Newport, Oregon as a case study. This comprehensive information came from the PackWave South environmental assessment that was used to support the FERC environmental assessment hydropower license at the site, all of which can be found online. Alicia and the team were interested in using a graphical map to display the large biodiversity that exists at different locations around this site. This graphic on the slide um, does not show all species identified at PackWave, but provides key examples of migratory and native species that are present at the site throughout the year. The map includes sea turtles, small and large cetaceans, shorebirds, pelagic birds, fish, pinnipeds, and plankton. Some of these species are listed as endangered species and others are recovered after being listed. The y-axis represents where species may be found in relation to the three operational areas at PackWave based on the available data. The x-axis then represents the seasonal length of time an animal may be in the area. The team also recommends that campaigns address the amount of time an animal may be exposed to known stressors found in the environment at a marine energy site. Using data like this may inform mitigation strategies to reduce localized impacts and promote ecological resilience, which felt like an, an important component to include in this conclusion paper. Next slide, please. One of the topics also discussed in the paper is how to evaluate the effectiveness of the recommendations, which were designed to be practical and help generate representative environmental monitoring data records for each stressor studied that can actually be utilized by stakeholders in the industry. So how can we assess if the recommendations are actually helping? Beyond journal statistics, citations, and reviews, the measurable effectiveness of these recommendations can be challenging to quantify. Assessing impact relies on feedback from end users to provide insights into how recommendations influence decisions within the industry. Part of this includes ensuring that results are openly accessible. Our special issue was published in an open access journal, which is really fantastic for that. Um, and then also making sure the results are under understandable to diverse audiences within the industry and beyond. Multiple avenues have been used to disseminate recommendations and engage with audiences more broadly, including traditional approaches like technical conferences and events, as well as informal stories and publicly available webinars like this one. From topic specific webinar attendance reports, survey responses, and any ancillary data on who engages and offers feedback, we can then gain insight into how stakeholders have used or plan to use recommendations. The hope is that through Triton's communications efforts, we can get valuable use case data or feedback from key stakeholders and end users in the industry, which then enables an iterative process that informs future research that addresses industry needs. We hope that you will participate in the survey at the end of the webinar, it's nice and short, um, which will help us understand your thoughts on the Triton field trials, the recommendations, and our content, so the Triton team as a whole can be as effective as possible in our efforts. 
And with that, I will now pass the presentation over to Tyler to dive into the energy sustainability aspects of this work. Thank you, Kylene. All right, so um, I'm gonna be talk taking a high summary of sustainability engineering uh, concepts, tools, and how they can be integrated with the Triton and TFIT results and use them biotically moving forward to achieve the overall goal of sustainable development of our energy systems. And also somewhat how these uh, sustainability engineering can be used and applied to other systems. So first, what, what is sustainability? Uh, it's generally defined as the conditions under which humans and nature can exist productively in harmony and fulfill the social, economic, and other requirements for not only our current um, society, but also future generations. And this uh, definition came out in 1969, so it's been around for a while. And it, um, from the get-go, highlights the, the three pillars, also known as the, the triple bottom line of sustainability. And that's, uh, you can see from the, the figure here, environment, economy, and society. And so I, I became involved with the, the Triton and, and TFIT effort when Alicia was developing this summary paper to the TFIT special issue in uh, the Journal of Marine S uh, Science and Engineering. And she had the broad vision and foresight of looking to the next steps. What, uh, where can these uh, results and findings be taken? Uh, towards the, the broader view of sustainability. And so you can see here in, in this figure that uh, vital um, is this, this type of environmental monitoring uh, program to identify the stressors and, and develop uh, technologies and uh, recommendations and sites for, for testing these new technologies. However, it's a, it's a portion of this larger uh, goal of sustainable energy development. And so what uh, we're going to be talking about a bit is, is how some of these recommendations can fit into the existing environmental sustainability tools, as well as some of the other tools available for um, economic and social sustainability. Next slide. So, uh, Tenants of life cycle sustainability are that a suite of environmental impact categories are evaluated in order to mitigate and avoid impact trade-offs. And so um, on imaged here are just a, a small portion of the potential environmental impacts that can be um, evaluated with a life cycle assessment. Um, one that you're probably very well familiar with is global warming potential, which looks at greenhouse gases. Uh, also, there's acidification potential, uh, water um, pollution from uh, nutrification, uh, also called uh, eutrophication. And that's uh, where it creates dead zones. You might have might be familiar with like a, a dead zone in, in the Gulf from the runoff from the, the Mississippi River. But this, uh, there are, are numerous other environmental impact categories, as well as uh, social impact uh, categories, environmental justice, and then, of course, economic uh, factors as well. So um, part of the, the climate um, challenge that we're facing today is because uh, when, when developing these systems in, in the past, we optimized for only one or two parameters, namely um, economics and efficiency. And so when you don't take a broader view and look at the other trade-offs, you can have these unintended consequences. And so by being sure to evaluate a suite of environmental impact categories, you can be aware of the trade-offs and help mitigate them and avoid unintended consequences in the future. And then another tenant is to um, assess impacts across all phases of the life cycle. And furthermore, into circular economies, seeing how uh, the impacts uh, affect the larger uh, market through consequential analyses and uh, other life cycles. And that uh, you use to avoid burden shifting and uh, also unintended consequences. So um, your your system may be um, the 
the use phase of your system might be more environmentally or socially sustainable, but maybe the upstream, uh, the, the resource requirements and how those resources are obtained might cause larger environmental impact or, or social impact, or the, the market system as it's consequentially affected. So if you're replacing a product um, that has other co-products, maybe the environmental burdens of the substitute for some of those co-products can, can also uh, cause unintended consequences. So really taking this broad perspective uh, across the life cycle and across a suite of impact categories in environmental, economic, and um, social spheres is, is really important. Next slide. And so um, just briefly, uh, uh, concepts related to sustainability engineering, industrial ecology, industrial symbiosis, and circular economies. Um, these concepts were developed alongside the, the field of, of sustainability engineering. Um, it's uh, interesting um, history. The, the uh, I'll be talking about life cycle assessments, which evaluate environmental impacts quantitatively over the life cycle. The first one was completed by Coca-Cola in 1969, uh, looking at trade-offs between different bottling uh, systems. But since then, um, the, the field has, has taken off and um, uh, the, the concept of industrial ecology is, is somewhat related to biomimicry, where we want our industrial systems to be more like biological systems, where the, the waste of, of one organism is the, the input um, for, for another. I mean, just plants and animals is, is a, you know, a, a prime example uh, between the oxygen and, and carbon dioxide that, that cycles between those um, two systems. And so um, the more that we can get our industries to um, utilize uh, rather than waste co-products from other systems, uh, we can eventually have this large um, circular system that functions more like biological systems. Next slide. And so here we're um, we're looking at a figure of the uh, marine energy life cycle and some example impacts, as well as um, how the the Triton and and T fit uh, efforts fit into that. And so a normal uh, life cycle would be kind of on the lower left of that that figure, starting with resource extraction, then going to the the scale up of manufacturing distribution. Um, installation, then the use, the operation and maintenance, decommissioning, whether and that's the generally called the end of life, and that can be either disposal, but in a circular economy, it's, it's more like recycling, reuse, and repurposing. However, on the, the upper right portion of, of the figure is this pre-deployment and testing improvement cycle. And so um, this is really, really important. And we'll, um, uh, we have a limited amount of time here, so I won't be able to talk about it much, but this kind of brings in the concepts of design for uh, environment, design for recycling, um, design for reuse, where early in the process, you, you look at these concepts and before you do full scale de deployment of a technology, you understand the, the impacts, and you can make changes to the design before full deployment. And so um, we'll, we'll talk about some of the other uh, impact categories for the environment, economy, and society here in a minute. But really this cautionary approach is, is vital and um, uh, uh, very important in making sure that these large energy systems as they're deployed uh, are sustainable. So next slide. So there's a, a suite of, of tools and methods available to look at uh, the triple bottom line or three pillars of, of sustainability. And so uh, my, my primary background is in life cycle assessments and they evaluate environmental burdens. And then there's also economic tools that include life cycle costing and techno-economic analysis. And they look at net present uh, values and, and payback periods. 
And then a, a newer form of life cycle assessment is, is social life cycle assessment that evaluates social costs. And we're also in the process of, of developing a, an environmental justice life cycle assessment methodology as well. And so when you combine these, these different methodologies into a common framework, they're known as life cycle sustainability assessments. But a lot of work is needed to align these methods and tools. So if you're interested, I would recommend you, you getting into the field of sustainability and help us uh, connect all of these approaches and take us to the next level. So next, next slide. So uh, very briefly, um, life cycle assessment is the compilate, comp compilation and evaluation of inputs, outputs, and potential environmental impacts of a product system throughout its life cycle. And so we looked a bit at the, the marine energy life cycle, and so you can see some of those similar uh, phases in the image to the right there. And uh, there's there's different scopes to, to what you can include in a life cycle assessment. Uh, so uh, a cradle of grate might just be looking from the, the upstream raw material extraction and acquisition through the production um, of energy and materials to the manufacturing. Then you can go cradle to use, cradle to grave, and then cradle to cradle is uh, going through this circular concept, including uh, recycling and, and reuse. And this methodolo methodology is, is standardized by ISO. So next, next slide. And I'll, uh, at the end, there's some information on uh, some links for some more information on these methodologies if you want to learn more. So here are uh, some, some long lists of different environmental impact categories. As I mentioned earlier, um, there's a, a, a large suite of, of different categories, and these uh, are, are just, just some of them. And so they're standardized. Uh, the Tracy is the North American um, methodology set by the, the EPA. And global warming in, in kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents is the most common used in carbon footprinting or embodied carbon, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but uh, it, as I mentioned, it's vital to look at these other trade-offs where, for an example, um, biofuels, um, early in the uh, generation one biofuels, uh, LCA showed that um, they weren't as uh, just because they, they were um, grown from plants didn't necessarily mean they were green. And so LCA helped um, the, the renewable um, biofuel industry reduce the global warming potential. However, there's still trade-offs in uh, other categories like eutrophication. Uh, and, and nutrient runoff. So really understanding this full suite so um, those impacts can be understood and minimized is, is vital. So next slide. So here you can see a long list of different social sustainability indicators. I won't, won't go through all of those. But as I mentioned, this is earlier, early in the development of these types of, of methodology. Um, but really making sure that as we're developing these sustainably, um, environmentally sustainable systems, that we're also including the societal in impacts and, and consequences, as well as those related to environmental justice and energy equity. Um, we don't want to um, offset, uh, reduce um, burdens overall, uh, but have specific burdens um, impact disadvantaged communities. And so through the lens of environmental justice, we can uh, help make sure that we minimize that as well as from a life cycle perspective. Next slide. So here's a couple of examples of um, social sustainability and EJ tools. So the EPA has the EJ screen, um, and there's uh, the they they combine demographic data with environmental impact data to um, produce indicators um, and and maps that that show hotspots in environmental justice concerns. And then there's also the the DOE lead tool to look at low income energy affordability data for energy equity concerns. Next slide. 
And then uh, life cycle economic tools include life cycle costing, um, uh, looking at uh, rather than just kind of the um, the the manufacturing of, of a product or um, the, the sales, right? It, it's looking at the, the full picture of construction through end of life and then wherever possible, the environmentally, the monetized environmental liabilities. But there's also a whole life cycle or whole life cost that that takes in non-monetized externalities uh, like environmental impacts and, and other um, costs, impacts and, and benefits. And techno-economic analysis is very similar to life cycle costing, uh, but generally looks at um, developing technologies to help ensure uh, economic viability in the market, while LCC generally looks at existing systems. Next slide. And as I mentioned before, uh, there's these concepts designed uh, for environment, repair, and recycling. And um, as Triton and TFIT are evaluating and monitoring the performance of marine energy systems early in the design process, these uh, sustainable approaches can be designed into these uh, in, into the, the systems before they are fully deployed, which is, is vital for overall sustainable development. And there's a uh, DF uh, design for environment or DFE um, evaluation tool that's um, uh, held by the, the EPA that you can use as well. Next slide. And I apologize, there's a lot to cover with, with sustainability and I want to leave time for uh, some questions. So uh, hurrying through some of this stuff. So I think I touched upon um, most of these through the talk, but some of the, the overall um, next steps and, and recommendations are to, to use these broad sustainability toolkits to, in, to capture the life cycle, environmental, economic, and social uh, trade-offs related to marine energy, as well as, as other systems. These, these tools can be used for uh, most, most everything, any product, system, um, and, and to allow for the implementation um, of these uh, improvements to maximize the benefits and minimize burdens. And I didn't get a chance to talk too much about this, but the, the collision risks, the underwater noise, electromagnetic magnetic fields, the changes in hab habitats, anthropogenic light stressors, um, those all can be used to help inform those existing or develop new life cycle impact assessment methodologies. Uh, to identify areas for improvement in the systems. And then uh, again, often overlooked uh, in the past has been kind of the social and EJ impact. So helping to make sure that the, the marine energy transition in, uh, doesn't uh, continue these historical patterns of injustice. Uh, use the principles of design for environment uh, early and often uh, in the design process for a precautionary approach. And, and a, a key recommendation as well is to, to obviously be um, learning as much as you can in this process and, and um, making the design changes early, but we're, we're facing some, some um, severe issues right now. So we can't wait too long to deploy these uh, sustainable technologies. So we really need to make an effort to, um, to deploy these renewable energy systems as, as early as possible. And that, that gets into a bit of my other work in growth curve uh, modeling, but that's that's a talk for another time. And then um, uh, also through the, the process of this, this research, um, making sure that the research itself is, is sustainable and applying these, these practices as well. And so with that, um, thank you for your time. And uh, I think we're gonna, uh, here's some, some resources for more information. Um, the uh, ACLCA.org, uh, uh, they are a life cycle assessment uh, organization. The um, LCA Commons has uh, publicly available access to links to publicly available data sets. And uh, at the lab here, we're pioneering some new environmental justice methodologies. All right. Thank you so much, Tyler. Um, those were wonderful yeah. resources. We've shared some of those in the chat. We do have about eight minutes for questions and then we'll do a quick wrap up. So if you have any, please put them into the chat um, as soon as you can and I will read them as they come in. 
to start off, we have a question for Linneg, going back to changes in habitat. So perspectives may differ on what habitats are most critical to study when monitoring the impacts of marine energy on habitats. How would you address this? Thanks, Melanie. That's a tricky question. I think it depends on different things. It depends on uh, what the regulators uh, who permit a site uh, are looking for and other stakeholders uh, who have oversight of uh, project development care about. It depends on what we already know about a site where development uh, will happen. And it also depends on uh, what uh, developers would be willing to monitor. If it's not uh, a requirement, a mandatory requirement, they might not be willing to monitor something, might not have the funding for that. Although if government is providing funding, they might be more willing to let to have some monitoring around there. So it's a discussion that needs to happen early on between all the different parties involved to, um, to discuss uh, what's the most up-to-date on sound science that we have about habitats at a site that is targeted and what it still needs to be known and, and monitored. Thank you. And we're leading into another question. I think this would be for Tyler. How difficult is it to complete an environmental life cycle assessment? And is there a streamlined approach? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So uh, traditionally, completing environmental life cycle assessments has been a, a resource intensive process. Uh, as uh, the, I imagine the, the first LCA back in the late 60s was was extremely difficult. Well, over the years, there's um, been a lot of background, uh, vital background elementary flows and life cycle inventories developed. So for practitioners, it's, it's become um, uh, a bit more easy, but you really have to become an expert in, in the, the various systems to be able to put together um, the full life cycle and, and evaluate these, these impacts. Um, we're, we're, us and a lot of other uh, researchers are trying to develop a, even more streamlined tools to enable these methodologies for, for everyone uh, as we're um, getting into the, the era of clean procurement uh, and, and buy clean, uh, requiring um, environmental product de declarations or EPDs that rely upon life cycle assessment as, as background. Um, that that really we have to enable everyone to be able to do these with with the minimal amount of um, of effort. So we're we're busy developing tools and and methods that that can be used to streamline the efforts. And then as far as um, just something that anyone can can do is take a life cycle thinking approach, looking at uh, even your day to day lives, right? Thinking about um, you know how how the materials got here. Uh, where are they going? What uh, might be the the trade offs? And so, um, you know, uh, just just doing life cycle thinking alone can really help uh, get a more sustainable uh, society. Good question. Thanks. We have another question from Ute Bronner. Sorry if I completely mispronounce your name. Have you ever considered balancing different energy sources in a green energy mix, especially when they're in different stages of their life cycle? For example, wind, wave, tidal, solar? Sure, so um, energy is, is a huge component pretty, to, to any system and, and an input to, uh, I, don't, I don't know that there's a life cycle assessment out there that doesn't have energy as an input. And so, um, and, and a, it, some systems, it's the, the primary driver of the environmental impact. So having an understanding of the, the different uh, energy um, production sources uh, is, is vital to have an accurate uh, representation of the, the environmental impacts. And so there is uh, background data in the the Fed Commons and the, the US LCI database on the, the North American uh, grid mixes that have the current mixes. And uh, the methodology allows for those to be tailored um, to kind of customize the, the different inputs for the different energy systems. Um, and um, 
also a, a big part of, of LCA is, is doing LCA on new energy systems in order to compare them to existing or other developing systems. So yeah, really kind of getting an understanding of these um, and, uh, and and having the, the mix of, of the energy uh, production systems is important and a big part of the sustainability engineering field. Hopefully that answered your question. Terry, you have another question here for you. How do you incorporate the environmental impact of the markets that marine energy is used for accelerates? I.e., if the cost of energy lowers, marine energy lowers, more desalination slash aquaculture, et cetera, can be renewably powered, which has its own environmental impact? So how yeah, so that's the environmental impact. Yeah, that's that's getting into kind of a, a whole system type of, of um, life cycle assessment there that that a, a big part of that is is consequential uh, impacts and, and consequential life cycle assessment. So looking at the consequences of um, putting a new product on on the market and how the, the market is going to shift, what the, the trade offs will be. Um, it's 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 not easy, right? And and it's not certain as well because you know you don't know what exactly is going to happen when you when you make a when a, a new disrupt, disruptive technology comes out or a new enabling technology, right? But um, at least uh, doing what we can to understand what those consequences might be and and plan for them uh, early in the process is is important. Uh, but but more research and development along those lines is is required. Um, so again, I, I encourage if, if you have any ideas on on how we can better do that, um, get get in touch with us. Okay, thank you, Glenn Spain. I see you have your hand up. I've allowed you to talk. If you have a quick question, we have time for one more. Sure. My, my apologies. My chat has been disabled for some reason. But in any event, I work for the commercial fishing industry. And one of the great lacks when we're considering massive um, uh, 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 industrialization for offshore wind is the impacts of those projects on the commercial fisheries, which are right in the many of the cases in the same areas. What are some of the problems that you're dealing with and some of the methods for looking at an analysis of those trade-offs? I don't know if, if anyone else wants to, to tackle that. Um, I, I can briefly say that uh, another study looking at Alaskan kelp to energy, uh, we took a kind of a, a holistic a, approach um, and uh, that was was included in in the the development and understanding of the the approach, um, and and so I think stout stakeholder uh, engagement, outreach, um, really getting an understanding from the people um, on you know doing that work um, and getting feedback is is vital. Yeah, I'll add to that. We definitely want to hear from all types of stakeholders in the industry. So if you have any ideas or topics you think Triton can cover, um, please let us know. Our email address is on this slide right here. We also have a survey um, which gives opportunities to, to bring about some of these, these topics of discussions. So I highly encourage you to connect with us. Okay, it is the top of the hour, so we I'm sure there are more questions, but please do utilize these resources. We just have a few more slides for you if you have time, and we do have a survey that would be really helpful for you to complete. It helps us with our outreach efforts. Our team has put together really helpful resources to help you stay connected, and you can find these at the link tree. It includes our monthly newsletter, the monthly Triton Stories blog, our upcoming webinars, and more. You can find all of these, like I said, in the link tree by scanning this QR code or by visiting our website at pnnl.gov slash projects slash Triton. Um, like I said, we'd love to hear your feedback and we encourage you to take our five minute survey so that we can continue to improve our outreach efforts. This concludes our last session of the 2022 Triton Talks webinar series. 
please take five minutes to fill out the survey once again. And we've included all the links that you need in the chat. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to contact us. Thank you, Lene, Kayleen, and Tyler, and Alicia. And thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you.